Well, congratulations. You have completed the listening workshop for the International ESOL test. Very much hope that you enjoyed it. Hope you found it informative, but also that you learnt to see the tasks not just from a teacher's point of view, not just from a tester's point of view, but from a learner's point of view. What you did there was not just listen to some of the um, international ESOL recordings and see the differences between the four parts of the listening, which there are quite significant differences. What you also did was to predict. You didn't just go into the listening without knowing what you were listening for. And this is something that you can take into your classroom with you. The whole purpose of these workshops is more than just to inform you. It is actually to give you a model that you can use in your actual day-to-day -day classroom teaching. And if you think back over the workshop, or even if you go back over the workshop, you can do that with um, online workshops. That's the great beauty of these things, that they're there for you for reference. If you go back, perhaps you'll recall that we looked at listening for inference of meaning. It's meaning beyond words. And what we need to do is to get our learners to think of what kind of situations are going to arise. What kind of language functions do people use? One thing that I find useful in my own teaching, you probably do it already, but if not, give it a try, is to get the learners themselves to come up with the dialogues. They don't have to be perfect, it doesn't matter. What we want them to do is to focus on apologising, explaining, agreeing, disagreeing, and seeing that sometimes the form of words we use is less important than the actual intonation pattern itself. During the workshop, um, you did tasks related to part two. If you remember, looking at where the speakers are speaking, what the relationship is, and why they're having the conversation. Again, in your classroom teaching, don't just press the button, don't just play the tape. Um, get the learners to create a scenario. Get them to look at it from the inside and to think, well, what relationships are there? What domains, as we call them, of the Common European Framework do people operate in? If they can see the listening from the inside, it will be so much less of a threat when they face this at the start of the test, which they always do. Um, part three was all about note-taking. The more practice learners can get in doing that, not trying to take dictation, as I hope you didn't in the, um, the workshop, that you don't need to write down every word, you need to get a brief, concise note of what's going on. But again, you need to look ahead you need to predict. Sometimes people think of listening as a rather passive activity. It doesn't have to be. It can be very active if you're engaged in what you're doing. Technology helps us, of course. Not only do you have the teaching support materials and the practice papers, um, you've got podcasts, you've got recordings of all kinds. The more you expose your learners to listening, the more comfortable they'll be with it. Don't forget you also did uh, the part four task, listening to infer meaning from um, a wider conversation, not just listening for individual words to match an answer, but trying to work out what the speakers are saying. Once again, take these techniques into your, into your teaching and get your learners to focus on the detail. One very simple practical teaching tip given to me by a friend the other day, was that it's sometimes good to play a listening activity. Uh, the teacher can pretend to get the wrong answers. The teacher doesn't always have to be perfect. Sometimes, if the teacher says, oh, that was the answer, the learners will be delighted to prove him or her wrong, and they have to go back and pinpoint why he or she was wrong. With reading, with listening, if we can make them as active as classroom activities as we can, take away this feeling that they're passive, then we will help our learners to learn. Um, we all talk as teachers about extensive and intensive listening, don't we, in, in general. That's a reason why we often play um, tapes twice at lower levels, or it's why we encourage our learners to listen extensively for gist and intensively for specific meaning. My experience is that listening is much more difficult at the lower levels. At higher levels, it becomes much more familiar. Um, I think it's a very good idea to encourage learners to listen extensively, not to panic, 
and to think that the first time you hear something at a A1, A2, B1 level, there's no right or wrong answer. Put a tag question in front of it, put a question like, um, do you think, or in your opinion, are the speakers friendly? So even if somebody thinks they are or thinks they're not, the job of tuning in, which is what extensive listening is all about, has been done. One thing I should always say, tips for teachers, it's also a question of preparing people for the tests. Uh, City and Guilds does everything we can uh, to test real life language and real life skills, but learners do benefit from a little bit of examination technique. A couple of tips, practical tips, tell them you don't need to get every single answer right in the listening. If you miss one, don't panic. You can't use a dictionary, there just isn't time in the listening part. In the reading and writing, you've got time, but the listening, get as much as you can. And above all else, if you feel you've done badly in one part, remember there are three other parts. If you felt during the workshop that you did some bits better than others, that's fine. We all do that. And the learners will, as candidates, get credit for what they do overall. So once again, thank you, well done, and hope that you feel you not only enjoyed the workshop, but you actually went through the experience of being in the position of a learner, which will help you in your teaching. Thank you very much.